Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's great to have here in studio the newly elected Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Jim Knight. Congratulations and Happy New Year. So great to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to be here. Glad to be here. And uh, December 2nd, we'll go back a month, you were um, you were brought in as mayor when the council reorganized. Susan Brooks became mayor pro tem. So how is it going? You know, one month on the job as mayor and uh, what are you looking forward to? Well, coming on as mayor, <laughs> there is a lot more responsibility. Uh, you're rep representative of the city and um, you're setting the agenda and you're trying to make sure th everything runs smoothly. Um, it's it's also an additional responsibility regionally for the South Bay Area. Um, you're part of certain selection committees and um, you, um, for instance, I had to go to a selection committee meeting for uh, electing the new uh, board member for Metro. It's a $40 billion budget. I mean, this is, this is a big thing. And so you're getting solicited by various mayors around different areas, Beverly Hills and Torrance and so on. Uh, and so it's, it's a... It's a much broader scope than just uh, running the city itself in many right. ways. More than those big binders that we see you carrying. Two, two meetings a month when the council meets the first mm -hmm. and third of the month. And uh, so you're, you've got something going probably daily. <laughs> yes, no, it's true. There, there, it, uh, what, what people see in the council meeting is just one aspect. There's a lot of preparation that goes before that. And it's a lot of things that we uh, need to, to address uh, pushing forward so we can get the agenda items move, to move things forward. All right. And during the show later on, we look forward to hearing more about your vision as mayor, your challenges ahead. But as we do every month here in City Talk, we like to bring our residents up to speed on just issues that you're addressing at the council at each meeting. Obviously, the biggest issue right now happening in the city is the council's ongoing search for a new city manager um, for those that have been you know paying attention to what's happened uh, you actually the council did vote on a contract to hire uh, Bill Widmer who was an mm -hmm. Atherton City Councilman from up north and that looked like he was coming on board and then about a week later I think you had ended up voting to rescind that mm -hmm. um, contract so why don't you explain exactly what happened with the selection of Mr. Widmer and where you're going next as the search continues. Yes, well, uh, we were moving forward with Mr. Widmer, um, and as you said, we, we had uh, got a contract that we felt was uh, uh, workable with him. And in the process later, uh, there became certain issues that uh, we couldn't come to agreement on. So uh, as a result, we, we withdrew that particular offer to him. And at the same time, we instructed uh, Bob Murray, who's our uh, consultant, to go out and recruit uh, to uh, bring us back uh, some, some other possible candidates. Um, I think we have some candidates that we can review, and I'm hoping, I'm trying to get this together so we can review those candidates and have an interview with them uh, sometime mid-January. And I, I'd like to kind of move this forward and get this resolved. Uh, Carolyn Petru has been an acting city manager in the meantime. She has done a stellar job holding the city down while we're getting a final city manager here. And uh, my hat's off to her. She's done an excellent job. We're lucky to have her to carry the city forward as we continue the search. Right. And the search we were saying before has probably gone on now for almost a year after um, city manager then Carolyn uh, Laird did not renew. And mm -hmm. so that's the search began. So you, I think you failed at least 49 candidates, right, that have been in the mix. So... You're looking forward to getting some more, but you know what exactly do you think that the council's look, sort of looking for with this next uh, city manager? Well, um, we did have a whole survey that went out to the community, and um, I think there's a consensus that we really want to have somebody who's had <coughs> previous city administrator or city manager experience, um, even assistant city manager. Um, some candidates come from a larger city that uh, they've had more responsibility, so uh, we're looking for somebody that has the experience, understands the role as a city manager. It's a very difficult role. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, almost a 24-7 type of thing. I mean, uh, um, it's, it's somebody that really understands that role. Uh, we have some labor negotiations coming up. Someone understands that uh, component of leadership. Um, so we, we're looking for somebody who has those qualities that will really understand the nature of our city. We're a coastal city and we have certain uh, aspects of our city that, that are unique and understand those, but bring in the professionalism we're looking for to run the city. Right, because I know with the selection of Mr. Widmer, he was a council member and of mayor from where he was from, but yet didn't have city manager experience exactly. Mm -hmm. So that may be reshifting now that you'll like to see some well, of that with your next choice. Yes, we, um, 
not necessarily. I mean, we, we, we're looking for somebody who has professional experience right. that, to come in. So um, um, I, I, I personally think that the city manager experience is good and important, but it doesn't necessarily Right, private else. sector experience yeah, is it, also valuable. It could be for the right candidate, the right person. All yeah. right. Well, we'll stay tuned. Obviously, this is a great city to manage, so yeah. you think you'd have quite a few uh, I think we're going to find somebody qualified. I, I really do. It's just a matter of getting that right candidate. All right. Well, you'll be keeping us posted. And in the best case scenario, do you think we'll have a new city manager by springtime? <laughs> I would hope so. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, as mayor, I'm trying to push this forward and, and get get uh, get it honed down. Uh, don't want to push it too too fast so we don't make the right decision. We need to do some vetting, but uh, I'm trying to push it forward. So yes, I, I'm hoping that uh, even before springtime, I hope we will have something. Okay. Decided. So this past Tuesday, the council just met, um, but it was a meeting where you worked on. Uh, uh, put, pick, putting together new committees. How did that go for the city and p putting new candidates out there? Right. The, the committees are standing. Uh, there's not new committees, yeah. but new members for, right. the, for the committee. Um, so we, let's see, we had um, Traffic Safety Committee, uh, Emergency Planning, and Stormwater Oversight Committee. We, we did elect, uh, um, we appointed um, some uh, candidates for that, and so those are all filled now. Uh, currently, uh, we still are looking to fill the Financial Advisory Committee, so we're going to have that coming forth down the road here. Are you impressed with the number of volunteers that we have in this community that want to come forward and help the city at some I level? I am very impressed. It, it is, when, when we have these interviews for people coming on committees, it is amazing the talent that is out in our community. I, I'm just astounded. Um, it, they come forth with tremendous background in a multitude of fields applicable to the committees and even beyond the, the, the scope of the committee. And um, they come in with a spirit of wanting to do something to help and volunteer for the community. I mean, the combination of the talent and the spirit of wanting to help the community is just, uh, I'm a, I just, makes me feel proud to be part of the city. Um, some announcements coming out of the city. We learned the finance director, Dennis McLean, will be leaving. And I don't know your thoughts on that and obviously filling that position now. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to see Dennis go. He has been an excellent financial, uh, the, the finance department director. Um, he's been in the city for many years, <coughs> 15 or 18 yeah, years, I, I think, think so, to that nature. He's, he's been a great guide for the city. Um, as you know, we've had a balanced budget since our inception of the city, and uh, Dennis is a large part of that um, in guiding us with that, and he's... He's done such an excellent job. He's a, he's a very thorough person, and so um, he doesn't leave a penny out that doesn't have an accountability to it. So he's done a fantastic job. Uh, I'm sorry to see him go. He's been excellent. But um, we recently appointed Catherine Downs, who was uh, his um, other uh, team in, in the finance department, um, as uh, acting city treasurer, because we have to conduct business mm -hmm. for the city. So the banks and so on have to have a representative that's officially a treasurer for the city. So we have Catherine in that position now. And, and we're in great hands with her. We're in great <laughs> hands with her. She is excellent too. I've worked with her for quite a few years now and she is fantastic as well. So um, that's, we're in good hands. Okay. Um, as we continue talking more about employees in the city, um, what's going on with the uh, labor negotiations with the city's employee association? Bring us up to speed with all that. What, what we decided to do, and I, I kind of pushed this forward on my own, um, I, I wanted to have what's called a classification compensation study. And the reason I wanted to do that is um, I don't want to have a us-against-them negotiation. I, I, I want to bring to the table for employees a neutral document that says, here are the classifications of comparable cities, here's the compensation for comparable cities, Let's start, let's start at that starting point. Mm -hmm. It seems and, fair. Yeah, and that's the idea. I want to be fair. I, I want them to be properly and reasonably compensated. Um, and I want to move forward with a spirit of teamwork between the staff and council and the public uh, of making the city the best city it possibly can be. And, and, and I think I want to reestablish that confidence with the, with the employees that uh, we're really working together as a, for a greater goal. And also you're bringing the community in because the way this is being done more openly um, in terms of the public is being able to see sort mm -hmm. of what negotiations are, how they're taking place. And, mm -hmm. and your it's thoughts on being, on being in the council that did that, that's, well, yes. that's unique, right? You don't see that in yeah, a lot it, of cities. Yeah, it is unique and it's, it's what they call uh, open government uh, mm -hmm. policy. 
And yes, we, yes, we will we'll keep the publics informed as we go along within negotiations, right? Excellent. Obviously, big concern always for all of the councils to keep our community safe. Um, so just anything you want to update with in the area of crime and safety in our PV, we all know how safe we feel here, but we also hear about upticks and burglaries and things like that. And Captain Bolin was at your uh, meeting in December just mm -hmm. talking about the ability to do more community policing and just kind of mm -hmm. give us an overview of where we are in terms of, um, of dealing with law enforcement in the community. Right. Um, I, I met Captain Bolin a few years back when he first got on and we had a discussion uh, together and we're on the same page and, and what I believe is there needs to be a close communication between the Sheriff's Department and the residents. The, if, if there's an issue with uh, a crime in a particular area, there needs to be communication with the Sheriff to say this is what we're doing, this is what we found out, and this is how you can prevent it in the future. And so um, uh, safety is very important. We're, we're a safe city already, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant to continue to, to make sure that it continues in that fashion. So um, I want to roll out a program uh, I put together, and I'm going to be talking to uh, Captain Bolin here soon, where um, I can come out with Captain Bolin to the homeowners associations. We can discuss the specific issues in their community street by street. Right. And we will also have information as to tips, how to prevent future. And it isn't just what's happening in burglaries and so on. There's cyber crime going on. We need to inform the people the whole gamut of how to make themselves mm -hmm. be in our city as safe as possible. So um, I, I, I'm going to try and get this rolling out here in the next month or so uh, and really make sure there's a close communication and, and let the people know how they can help prevent crime in the future. And Neighborhood Watch is one of the aspects that's helpful is just if people are aware of what's going on in their community and if something looks suspicious, they have the phone they can pick up and, and call the sheriff if right. they think something doesn't look, doesn't look right. Captain Mullen often says, and when I sit down and do interviews with him as well, how important Neighborhood Watch is in terms of helping mm -hmm. them solve crimes, get to the bottom of things. Because, you know, when you see them, something strange, you go with your gut instinct. I know that happens right. to me sometimes in our neighborhood. Right. But I think every day I get something from my living sea view from our Neighborhood Watch mm -hmm. committee that says, you know, somebody saw this or saw this mm -hmm. driving around or suspicious van. So. But, you know, even if it happened to be a, some when visiting a friend, right. they, they, the people will say, well, I appreciate that someone's watching the street, right. so there's be no safe. harm in, in, in doing that. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to seeing how that works out. This seems tremendous, especially like you, when you go into the different neighborhoods in RPV, you are going to find different concerns, no doubt. Right. I mean, we, living along the drives, that tends to be a higher area where there's things happening mm -hmm. more, you know, with so you're more exposed, the, right? The other thing is, what's important about communication, I know a last, it was about Two years ago, uh, in our community association, we had um, uh, Dave Roses come by and just say hello and talk to us. They didn't know we had a video camera in our community. Communication is so important. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that that's where that communication can help. <coughs> and we department. bring up video cameras. I know there's been discussion about having them at the entry points to the cities. What, mm -hmm. what's, can you bring us up to what's going on with that? Or is that that a, has been discussed at the regional law enforcement uh, committee, and, uh, and the city councils are in the process of discussing that. Um, I think it can be a helpful tool. There are certain technologies available that can be very helpful for the sheriffs uh, in, in solving crimes. We have to deal with a privacy issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that some citizens are very concerned about. Um, I personally think if we have them in areas that are just focused on public roads and nothing else, that there shouldn't be a, uh, an issue with that. But we have to make sure we do something that uh, uh, doesn't uh, infringe on anybody's civil liberties. Right. It's that fine line you're walking right. there. Okay, well, moving on to um, an issue that comes up at the council is what's going on with the uh, telecom portion of the user utility tax. Um, a refund process is going on when they realize there was fees being collected that shouldn't have been being collected. Mm -hmm. And so why don't you explain what's happening there and kind of give us a history lesson on what happened with that. With yeah, that. okay, I'll give you a little background. <laughs> uh, uh, a few years back, the voters passed a utility user's fee. It covers telephone, gas, electric, all the utilities. And that was uh, a source of revenue for the city to help uh, provide the services for the, for the residents. Uh, at some point, the telephone component, and, we're, and the, the, the issue we're dealing with is only the telephone component of the utility user's fee. It doesn't affect gas, electric, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, telephone services began to change. 
You had the cell phone services. You had uh, phones now connected with internet services. And so at a certain point, our law wasn't compliant with this new change in, in the uh, FCC uh, rulings and so on. Uh, so at one point in the council, back at a certain point, said, okay, let's change our law. Let's make it compliant with the, with the FCC. So they did that. The law progressed further down the road, a while back later, um, and then they, they said, well, you, the council can't do that on their own. They have to bring it out to the voters again. Okay, fine. So we as a council tried to bring it forward, uh, to bring it out so we could revise the language, bring it out to the voters and say, you decide if you want this to continue forward or not. Uh, but in order to do that, we had, we had to have a 5-0 vote. It had to be unanimous council. We couldn't get that vote. So uh, at this juncture, we, um, as soon as we found out the noncompliance, we, we set up a refund process. We have that process going forward. Uh, at some point in the near future, we'll have an application process of which uh, people can apply for a refund uh, if they wish. And uh, we also, um, we have something called a, a gift to parks program. If they feel they want to just donate it to the, to, to the parks, we have a gift to parks program as well. So. All right. Was that about, was it about $25 per refund? I think it was somewhere like in the range of 25 to 35 yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then down the road, if you still decide you want to bring it out to the voters, that something Absolutely. you can do. Absolutely. Council can decide to do that if they want. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, at your December 16th meeting last month, um, one issue I want to move on to had to do with the uh, Burma Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Land Conservancy uh, president came forward and said that they were going to possibly be renaming the trail, but then that shifted. So just explain that because it, it was an emotionally charged issue, it felt <laughs> yes. like. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, it's another one of those situations where we didn't have all the information in front of us, I think, to, to, to understand it carefully. Um, <clears throat> Years ago, the council, of course, went into partnership with the Land Conservancy in terms of maintenance of the land. The land is owned by the city. Land Conservancy has agreed to maintain it, and there's a, there's a partnership and agreement with there. Uh, as as any nonprofit like a, a Land Conservancy, they have to raise funds, and like anything else, like hospitals will get wings named after a certain person if they make a certain donation. The council agreed to have a system whereby certain things could be renamed, whether it's benches, trails, and there's a whole slew of things. It ranges from, there's certain thresholds for each uh, uh, privilege. Mm -hmm. um, it goes from 100000 up to $10 million. So to rename a trail, do you know what that? I think it's about $100,000. Okay. In this particular case, the, the donation was far exceeded that, and they just decided on a trail. Um, the, I think the misunderstanding is that that right is applicable to both the city and the land conservancy. Um, now, if the city had some donation that meet the threshold and the person wanted to have something named, we could follow the same policy. In this particular case, the Land Conservancy garnered the, uh, the donation. So they have the right under the current arrangement under the to current rename arrangement, a trail. Who, whoever, either the city or the Land Conservancy, if you have a certain threshold of donation, either one, either party has the right to do that. So in this particular case, the Land Conservancy garnered the, uh, the donation. And um, there was some controversy in the community because the name Burma is related to, um, well, it's kind of a long history, but it has to do with World War II when the Japanese actually had submarines over here that were, there was one uh, freighter that was hit off our coast here by a Japanese submarine. They attacked um, a place up the coast in Santa Barbara, an oil derrick. So there's a lot of fear. So people are out on Burma Trail watching for submarines because there was no radar at the time there's no gps it's the only way you can see these things was by visual sighting and so it was in honor of a burma trail in china that was to help protect the chinese mm -hmm. anyway there's a long history to it I, it's probably too long for the program right now but um there was a certain significance to that particular name and uh, the donors from the land conservancy uh, uh, decided they wanted to keep the name and but have the trail dedicated to them uh, in, that, in that capacity so that seemed to Solve the issue. Yeah, it seemed like it was yeah. a, good, a, good a good ending. A good ending, yeah. So you'll see markers now along the Burma Trail that will say this is dedicated to the family that made right. that donation. That's right. But also seem to bring up the fact that when it comes down the road, um, that either, either or, I think there would seem to be confusion that the city would always, because it is city, the preserve it's, is owned by the city, they would the, the final say or be part of it, but that's at the moment not the case. Either right. or can make a name change, but right, obviously exactly. everybody wants to be sensitive and do the right thing. 
Yeah, no, no. Either the city or the, or the land conservancy can, if they have to meet the certain threshold, in this particular case, mm -hmm. the land conservancy did, um, and that's a previous agreement. And it is a mechanism that nonprofits and uh, other entities use to help raise funds because someone's looking for a legacy. For but regarding putting the markers on a trail in the in the preserve, um, that still goes before council, right? You right, have to just, approve that. Well, we have to prove that location and so on. Yeah, right. So okay. Well, I'm glad that one was resolved. Yeah. Um, on the on the subject of what's going on in uh, out there in the community, we have workshops happening as they are working on a. Uh, parks master plan update mm -hmm. for all of the city's beautiful parks and trying to get the community involved and I know they have 12 workshops total through February mm -hmm. so people need to look at the city website to kind of find out when the That's park right. is near you but mm -hmm. how is it going and what are you trying to accomplish with this it's it's going well um, we again kind of a general policy of the city is to reach out to, to the residents and find out what concerns they may have or, or, or what uh, vision they have in terms of in this particular case the parks uh, master plan up to date update um, so yes, we, we ha again look at the website uh, and um, uh, there will be some upcoming workshops. We've had good success with it. Um, the staff has done an excellent job of, of showing what the park is, what the original plan is, and maybe uh, you know what, what vision may happen in the future. Um, and we're getting some good input from people and uh, sometimes we have a very intelligent residence uh, community mm -hmm. and sometimes like, they'll, they'll raise issues we didn't think about so right. um, it's, it's been very helpful. But we have an impressive park system here and I mm -hmm. uh, think it's well utilized by the residents in the community. Are you, are you, do you, would you like to see more people using our parks or how do you feel about that? Well, yeah, I, I, I sure. Yeah. I think it's we have a fantastic park system. It, it's a it's kind of a multi-dimensional park system. We have active, active recreational parks, mm -hmm. and then we have the whole preserve, which is uh, kind of a separate entity in the sense that it's under the NCCP, and we have trail uh, guidelines and so on with that. Um, but we have, in terms of open space recreational use, this city is top notch, and and there are people from all over the city that do come out and enjoy our parks, mm -hmm. but. We, are, we want to get the input from local residents to see what they like to see. For the All right. I know personally I'm out in the trails at least once a week. It's, it's incredible that we have this right here in our backyard. It was a long, hard process, and I was part of that fight to, to protect that over the years. All right. And, uh, I wonder if you have a favorite trail out there. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to tell anyone because it's your secret <laughs> spot. That's right, my secret <laughs> spot. <laughs> I think we did this before <laughs> down there. But uh, no, they're all good. Yeah. Um, as we continue on looking at sort of what's happened at the last few meetings that you've had, um, there was a public hearing um, regarding uh, an appeal to a planning commission decision to deny a um, height variance for a home on its uh, Via Rosa. Mm -hmm. And um, so the homeowners were trying to um, build up and came and it was denied and it came to you guys. So what's happening with that one? Okay, when you say it was denied, it was denied by the planning right, commission. Right, planning commission, right. then it came then to it the was council. Appealed to the plan to the right. city council, right. And so we have the final decision on that one so once it's appealed to us. Um, well, just so I'm not sure how many people are familiar with our measure M and, and neighborhood compatibility component, some cities have what's called a floor to area ratio, FAR. That usually works well with commercial property, but it, it, it doesn't really work that well for residential in the sense that um, you don't have a component of trying to keep a cons consistency within the neighborhood itself, make, keep it compatible. So we have a neighborhood compatibility component and it involves um, a bulk and mass, uh, a view preservation, and privacy. Those are the three essential components of it. Uh, in this particular case, the real issue was a bulk and mass of, of the pro project. Now there are other uh, properties in the neighborhood that have kind of bulky and massive uh, uh, mm -hmm. improvements, but they were before Measure M. So we, we, are, we have to follow certain guidelines under Measure M. We have to make certain findings with that. I gotcha. The council couldn't make the, all the findings, and mainly because the bulk of mass, I think, was the issue. And so we directed the uh, applicant another opportunity to go back and redesign and see if you could bring that bulk of mass down to be more compatible with the neighborhood. So you'll be hearing that in February? I think so. I, yeah. think, I think it's on yeah, the agenda. It's okay. On, on February, yeah. So we'll stay tuned for that. But does that you don't often get that in front of the, the city council, do you? Well, not too often. Because um, you were a planning commissioner for I a while. I was planning so commissioner for eight you've years. Been there. Yeah, and so our planning commission, I think, does a, a good job of vetting these things in a way that's uh, fair. And uh, and so it's it's. Uh, but these are matters of judgment. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, if if a applicant feels that they. Um, 
disagree with the decision, they have the right to appeal to the city council. But yeah, in general, we don't get it too often. Okay. Uh, well, as we're starting to wrap it up here, we've got a few minutes left. I'm wondering, 2015, you're excited about the new year, just sort of your vision and where you're going with your goals for the running the city, right. leading the city. Leading the city. Well, I'm trying to <laughs> provide strong leadership. Um, I am involved in other regional areas, uh, the South Bay Cities Council of Government. I'm, I am a, a delegate for that, and so I've been working with that for several years. There's certain resources that are regionally we can tap into, and I want to continue my contacts that I've made over the years with that to uh, enhance the opportunities for our city. Uh, there's the South Bay Energy Services Center that I've been working closely with um, that have provided some energy saving devices for the, the city. Um, we, um, I'm rolling out a program that I started about a year and a half ago to um, straighten out our street lights. Um, I, I saw a bill a while back, about two years ago, of $300,000 for uh, what they call LS1, uh, Southern California Edison owned street lights, just said various. There was no articulation of what they were. Well, I just said we need to dig into this and find out. We have discovered we have a lot of street lights we're being charged for that don't exist. Wow. So this is the process I want to go forward with and make our city run as most efficiently as possible and this is why you have a full-time job if you're finding out this kind of thing doing that kind of research you have well, a lot exactly this 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 took a lot, a lot of time of for me to, to dig and research this and I had help from staff and and what I'm also the connection was with South Bay Energy Services Center my connections there helped with uh, mm -hmm. with some process that, that's that with to get that put forward so that's just one aspect we have the infrastructure uh, of the city we need to we're going to be taking a broad look at that we had a great success with san ramon canyon fantastic project excellent one of the biggest projects in our history uh, but we need to continue forward with other infrastructure projects uh, um, in terms of either updating or make make sure we have a reserve fund to maintain them and we keep them going forward all right so we we are in the process of doing that there's quite a lot going on in the city I and mean, you may not have time to cover it all right well now. that's why we're going to have you here every month we appreciate you coming in and taking the time and just keeping the residents posted and all the great things happening in our city and we do have a great city and great leadership with you we're thrilled that you're mayor and uh, i look forward to being and having you in the studio every month and keeping us up to speed Thank you, Liz. I look forward to it. All right. Enjoy that trip to Sacramento, and we'll see you here in okay. February. Thank you. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk here with Mayor Jim Knight. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, everybody.